This talk is aimed at mechanical engineers who have tried to take an interest in object-oriented programming, but who have been left dissatisfied in some way. Maybe the explanations have been too theoretical, or you can't see the real point of it, or it doesn't seem relevant to your coding, or maybe you can't see how to apply it in practice. So I'm going to come at it from a different direction. I'm hoping will hit the spot better for mechanical engineers. This represents the way people were writing code in the early 80s, in the Fortran and C tradition, let's say. But there was a massive upsurge in development at that time, and people expected more and more from the software. And before long, the combination of this programming style and the ever-increasing complexity led to a crushing set of problems for developers. The code took longer and longer to develop, more and more bugs crept in, it got harder and harder to change it, it took longer and longer for new people to learn it, when you did change it it tended to break, you couldn't share the work out realistically between multiple people, hardly any of the code could be reused, and the idea of a worldwide community collaborating on open source software was out of the question. The developers looked on enviously at the people who designed complex machines like this engine, because they didn't seem to be having the same problems. They created their machines by assembling separate parts and subsystems, and that seemed somehow to circumvent completely nearly all the problems that the software developers were having. The engine people could get different people to work independently on the separate parts before they're assembled together. And they can test and validate components in isolation. And they can change the overall engine design quite easily by just swapping out parts with new alternatives. No single person had to understand every tiny detail of every single piece. And some of the parts they didn't even have to design or make because they could just go out and buy them. So the software developers marched up to the gates of the computer science universities and banged on the doors and said, we want a new way to program that lets us build our software by assembling and connecting small separate pieces. And the academics said, OK, just let us go away and think about it for a while, will you? And then eventually they came back out and said, we're ready. We've invented object oriented programming for you. It's a way to build software by assembling and connecting small separate pieces, each with their own job to do. Now, at its heart, that's what object-oriented programming really is. That's why it was invented. A way to build software by assembling and connecting small separate pieces, each with their own job to do. That's the fundamental principle of object-oriented programming that I'm going to show in the rest of this talk. So let's move on to look at a software example. Here's a tiny bit of Python that steers a boat. We're going to try and steer a course of 30 degrees. This is Python's way of doing a loop that never stops. Python uses indentation instead of curly brackets. So it's saying, do the following over and over again continuously. First ask the compass which way we're pointing and we're simulating the answer with this line of code, which essentially always says 31 degrees, but with mixed in noise to the tune of plus or minus 20 degrees either side, or in other words, great dollops of noise. Then we're working out what correction to send to the rudder based on how far off course we are. And I'm just printing that correction out so you can see it. And this is what we get. You can see the compass readings swinging wildly about, and consequently the wild corrections we're sending to the rudder. So I think the boat's going to do this, which is not quite what we intended. It seems we need to process the compass readings with a sort of smoother. Now, if we were designing a machine, we'd go out and buy a smoothing black box and put it in, like this and we'd send each new compass reading into it and then we'd ask the box for the new smoothed value to use instead of the single reading we just got and we'd use it in the calculation. But it isn't a machine, it's software. 
But the whole point of object-oriented programming is that we can build our software from small separate pieces. So we can do exactly what we want. We can create and use a smoothing black box. If it was a physical black box, we'd look in a catalogue and choose a suitable one based on its data sheet. And we'd probably use its part number to order it. Well, with object-oriented programming, our data sheets are called classes. Classes are the specifications for things that we can decide to put in our program. In this line of code, the class we're using is the class called smoother. And this bit is saying, make me one. Or in object-oriented speak, it's saying, instantiate one. So now the program has a smoother object in it, and we assign it to this variable so we can interact with it. We say that our variable compass smoother is an object of type smoother. Or better still, our variable compass smoother is a smoother. So let's look at it in the context of our steering code now. This announces to the program that we're going to use the smoother class and that it can be found in the separate source code module called filters. This is where we instantiate one to use in our program. Here's where we send each new compass reading along to the smoother. And here's where we ask it for the latest smoothed value. Here's where we use the smoothed value in the adjustment calculation. So, as you can see, the object-oriented approach does give us a pretty good approximation to plugging in a physical black box. So just before we look inside the smoother class, let's decide how it should work. It can keep track of the last 100 values it's received using a data structure a bit like this tube of tennis balls. Once it's full, if you add another one, the oldest one gets pushed out the other end and is discarded. And then, when it's asked to provide the latest smoothed value, it can calculate a pretty good one by working out the mean value of the 100 that are in the tube. Most modern programming languages provide an ideal data structure for this, called the double-ended queue. It's normally abbreviated, and you pronounce it DEC. Here's how we define a class in Python. This is the name. And here are the methods that the class has. Methods are just functions that belong to a class. And you can think of them as messages that you can send to the class. It might be a message to tell it to do something, like receiving the new value, or a message that asks a question, like get the latest smooth value. You usually want to say in a class that objects made from it should carry around their own data. It's a bit like saying every thermometer has to have its own mercury inside it. Our smoother, for example, is going to need to keep hold of those last hundred values inside itself. So you need a way to make sure this data is initialized and set up right every time you instantiate a new one. And that's where this oddly named method init comes in in Python. It's called automatically for you every time your program instantiates a smoother. In object-oriented speak, it's called a constructor. Constructors look a bit different in some other languages, but the principle is always the same. For the smoother, the constructor sets up the deck structure we just talked about. When you see the word self like this, it refers to the particular object that's been instantiated. Most other languages call it this rather than self, but it's the same thing though. You can see there's very little to it, really. When you call the receive value method, it just stuffs the value you send it into the deck. And when you call the get smooth value method, it just does the average like we said it would. And that's all there is to classes, more or less. So let's see if it actually works. Well, yes, it does. We're getting nice small adjustments now and not overreacting to the noise from the compass. So now I think we have to challenge ourselves. Did those object-oriented 
academics deliver on the big promise? Have we really created the benefits that the engine designers enjoyed by building their engine from small separate pieces? The engine people farmed out the alternator design to someone else. Well, we can farm out the smoother to somebody else. The alternator people tested it before they brought it back. Well, the smoother developer tested it before she brought it back. The engine people could swap in a different alternator if they wanted to. Well, the steering people could swap in a different smoother if they wanted to. The engine people didn't have any need to look inside the alternator. And the steering people don't have any need to look inside the smoother. The engine people bought in the alternator from a supplier. And the steering people used a smoother that somebody else made. So did the academics deliver on the promise? Yes, they did. So hopefully, if you're a mechanical engineer, this way of looking at the principles behind object-oriented programming has painted it in a new light. Hopefully it's a new light that makes it more relevant to your programming and that shows the underlying benefits. If you'd like to learn more, you might like to look out for two follow-up talks I'm going to, to produce, again aimed at mechanical engineers. The first is going to talk about the benefits of separating interfaces on your classes from their internals, and the second will look at decoupling, how valuable that is and how design patterns can help us with it. Before I go, can I say thanks to Centaur, Paul and Chris for your great help you gave me with the talk. Thank you for your interest. Happy instantiating.